Hello and welcome to Shadow Mountain Publishing, this virtual book event. I'm Gaynalyn Condi, the host, and I'm so thrilled to be talking with Nyland McBain today and her project, her book, her passion, and uh, the insights that she's gained. I know that you're in for a treat. And if you're watching live, we would love to hear where you're watching from. So please put those in the comments. If you're watching this on replay, I hope you will feel the the spirit of this conversation and and the inspiration that has really come from uh, this project, this book specifically that we're going to talk about today, pioneering the vote. And it's a beautiful cover. It's a it's a wonderful format. I've really enjoyed diving deep into it as an author. I've really appreciated the way it was framed and structured because it was. It gave a little bit of everything, and I really love that uh, buffet concept of, of reading that it allows a reader that may gravitate towards a certain style. So, Nylon, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, a little bit about your background. If people are watching from uh, other parts of the country or the world, they may not be as familiar with Better Days 2020, but that's kind of where I became familiar with you and your work, and you've had a huge impact here in Utah with that project. I, I wanted to just touch on that a little bit and, and maybe clarify for those that are local, what came first, the book or Better Days 2020, or was it simultaneous or was it you know a synergistic effort? Do you wanna talk on Better Days 2020? Cause I know that's kind of coming to a close, but it's, uh, it's, it's made a huge impact here locally. Yes, absolutely. I co-founded Better Days 2020 almost four years ago when a friend and I recognized that the year 2020 was going to be particularly significant for women in Utah, but also for women of our whole nation. And there are a couple of key anniversaries that we've celebrated in 2020 this year that were brought to our attention. Uh, first of all, uh, February of 2020 marked the 150th anniversary of Utah being the first place in the nation where a woman voted under an equal suffrage law. And uh, I, this was shocking to me that um, as a transplant to, to Utah, I didn't know this. Um, I thought that it would be much more a part of the state's um, image and brand uh, across the nation. But I was even more surprised when I started realizing that Utah natives didn't know this fact either. It seemed like such a wonderful accolade and such a wonderful um, piece of our history that, that should be a part of all of our lives here in Utah. And uh, my co-founder and I really discovered that this was not, this was an untold story. Uh, and that this anniversary of coming up in 2020 was actually a wonderful opportunity to popularize this history, to, to reinvigorate this story. And that's what we set out to do. So um, I think we have a, a, a slide actually showing some of the significant dates of this year. So maybe uh, number two there shows that 2020, as I mentioned, we commemorate the 150th anniversary of Utah's first vote, the first women in the nation to do so. But um, as, as many of our listeners might be aware, it's also been the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which is a constitutional amendment that was added to the U.S. Constitution to remove um, gender as a barrier to voting. So the, the amendment said you can no longer prevent women from voting because of their gender. Um, and that was a huge step. As, I, as I'll talk about, uh, I think, I hope more going forward, it wasn't a one and done sort of thing, but it was, it was a very significant step for the women of this nation. And then lastly, we celebrated the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act uh, this year in August as well, which was one of these uh, additional pieces of legislation that was needed to ensure that women from all communities and, and in some cases men too from all communities in the United States had the opportunity to have their political voices heard and counted. So we started this organization and um, we had a goal of working through education, legislation, events, and the arts. And one of the things we did early on was go to different organizations around the state and say, what could you do to celebrate 2020 using your resources? And happily, um, Shadow Mountain tapped me to write a narrative uh, nonfiction version of the story behind Utah's uh, suffrage uh, emancipation of its, of its women. Um, and I was very honored to be able to do that and had to do it very quickly to get it out in the time frame and time for the anniversary. 
but it was really a, a fantastic project for me to be able to work on so that I could really sink into this history and learn it on a very deep and complex level. So as an author, I have really, I, I write inspirational nonfiction. And so I haven't tackled, but my favorite genre is historical fiction uh, to read as a consumer. And I really appreciated the narrative format because I think it allows you to kind of, you know, dive into the experience, not just watch it as an observer looking back, but throwing the word looking back out there, I really loved how it was formatted. If those that are watching this aren't familiar and haven't picked up a copy, which I would highly recommend doing, and especially as a gift for the holidays for, for men and women in your life, but especially I think young girls, I'm a mother of a, a 16, almost 17 year old daughter, and I'm grateful that she'll have access to this story. You do have looking back sections in the book. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you formulated and formatted this book? Was it you? Was it Shadow Mountain? Was it collaborative so that you could do these little um, historically accurate profiles and historical uh, vignettes while still keeping the narrative going? Yeah. So that's one of the most unusual things about the book, of course. The book is focused uh, on telling the story of the 1895 Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference, which was a convention of 8,000 women that was held here in Salt Lake City in May of 1895. Um, and it was this, this really fantastic event because it represented a sort of center point in the Western suffrage movement. Up until that point, for decades, there had been a lot of tension between um, the Utah suffragists and the U Utahns generally, and the national suffrage movement. And I can get into why that tension existed. But um, in 1895, that tension was finally sort of put to rest. And it was this really, this moment of, of unity where national suffrage leaders and Utah suffrage leaders could come together, 8,000 strong, and look forward and look at how they were going to continue the movement, um, have more successes and more triumphs going forward. And so I chose to place the book there because I felt like it was a really great moment in history where we could look back and look forward. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I, I use that, that particular event as a narrative driver, um, but the book is a nonfiction book. It is not historical fiction, even though there are some scenes where I've um, created some dialogue that is not does not have its roots in primary source documents. And as I was writing this, it kind of wrote itself that way very naturally. I'm not a trained historian, I'm a trained writer, but I uh, I wrote what I wanted to read essentially. And, um, and I was looking on a really short timeline. So I kind of just had to get it out. And these women, these women are so close to me and I've lived with them for so long. And, you know, I've handled their journals and I've read their letters and they just, their voices came so naturally to me that I kind of just wrote it the way I was going to, what I was going to want to read. And I sent it at one point to my Shadow Mountain editor. And I said, you know, I might have a little bit of a problem here because this is not, um, this is not strictly uh, a nonfiction history. Uh, I have all of the notes, it's all documented. You know, I have hundreds of primary source documents, but I am bringing these women to life in a way that is non-traditional for accurate, um, you know, academic his historical work. And I said, do you want me to, do you want me to change it? Should I, and she, she said, no, she was the one that had the idea of putting them in different fonts, which I just thought was so clever. So as you read the book, um, there are these uh, sort of manufactured scenes which are in one font. Um, and then the majority of the book, which is the the sort of documented historical part is in a different font. And uh, I, I have heard that it, 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 wor it really works. At first I was a little nervous about it, but um, it really works. And I'm really grateful uh, to Shadow Mountain and my editor there for for coming up with that idea. And I, I think as you, as you mentioned, the, the audience for this book is, um, is, is just a mainstream audience. It's not academics, it's not historians, it's not even historic, historical hobbyists. It's for people who really may not know anything about this. And um, that was really a whole motivation for not only the book, for, but for Better Days 2020 generally, was that we take this story outside of the PhD theses and outside the academic libraries because it existed there. Um, there was, you know, there were some esoteric references to it in, in various places, 
but we wanted to popularize it. That's always been our mission. And so the purpose of this book is really to, to just get that narrative out there in a really accessible and, and fun way. So I'm glad to hear that you found it like that. And, um, and I've heard that it's been successful in doing that. Well, I think I, I love when we see a gap and we fill it. And I feel like it's very um, true to the, to the story and to the book that you saw a gap and you filled it. These women, you know, in the, in the mid to late 1800s, 1800s saw a gap and worked to fill that. And I love that it was um, accessible at various levels, right? It was, it, to me, as an academic, you would still learn, but there was definitely even probably at a certain level of education, a gap here in Utah that we weren't aware of, right? And that wasn't being discussed within even the the environments you would think it would come up in, right? Yeah. And so I, I love that it can kind of meet everyone where they're at. And I, and I, I think all the way up to, you know, a, a true academic would find value in it, but it, it's not so overwhelming and heavy in its, in its verbiage and its format that it feels daunting and, and makes you not want to dive into it. And yet I, I appreciate that there's meat in it as well. You mentioned Nyland, that um, it it felt like the story told itself and that these women had become so real to you that as a writer, it just flowed the this narrative did. Could you comment or share a little bit more about at that at what point that became specifically um, the main, you know, heroine of the story? When did her voice feel solid to you? Like, was it a specific journal? I'm always intrigued at what point does it feel like these women and, and the narrative felt authentic to you? And so whatever documentation you needed, you knew you, you were telling a relevant, but also accurate story. Yeah. Um, I think maybe one place to start with that is um, maybe if we could show slide three, when we started our work with Better Days 2020, we landed on three points that we wanted all Utahns to know by the end of this year. And uh, these three points were that Utah women were the first in the modern nation to vote under an equal suffrage law. The second, as I've, as I've mentioned, and I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. The second was that Utah suffragist Emmeline B. Wells met four US presidents in her work for women. This was just one of many accolades that we could have highlighted for Emmeline. Um, and she's really the, the primary name that we want all Utahns to know this year. And then thirdly, that Utah elected the first female state senator in the nation, and that was Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon. Um, and so we started with those three points and we really, we really got to those three points from, from the beginning of our research, really reading um, a, a a primary biography by Carol Cornwell Madsen of Emmeline B. Wells. And Emmeline um, became really the, the focal point for me personally of the Better Days 2020 project. And then of course, for this book. So Emmeline B. Wells uh, was a, a Massachusetts native. She uh, joined the LDS church and moved to Nauvoo, Illinois uh, with, her, with her family. And then um, as a 17 year old came to the Salt Lake Valley and then lived the rest of her life here in, until she was, I think, 92. Um, and she had an absolutely remarkable life. She was trained very well in Massachusetts. She had a great education and had aspirations to become a poet. Um, but because of the system of plural marriage that she was involved in here in Utah, she actually had to um, support herself financially and her five daughters. Um, she was the sixth wife of Daniel Wells, who was the Salt Lake mayor. And yet she didn't live with him because of her, her status in the family. Uh, and she had to provide for herself. And so she used her literary gifts to edit the Woman's Exponent, which was one of the longest running suffrage newspapers in the nation. And I think we have a slide of that actually. Yeah, um, slide seven shows the Woman's Exponent. Um, and so Emmeline was the editor of that for 36 years and was able to support herself. And that was a newspaper that um, sort of uh, officially was a, was a representation of the Relief Society of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But as you can see from the 
um, masthead here, they really imagined the newspaper to be advocating for the rights of the women of Zion, but also the rights of the women of all nations. And so Emmeline was a really wonderful example of the, um, the early Utah suffragists who saw the vision uh, of something much bigger than just Utah women voting, or even just becoming a state where Utah women could vote. They really saw their work as leading the nation. And then eventually when Emmeline met um, Queen Victoria as leading the world. And so she had some remarkable experiences as she added to this newspaper and as she attended national suffrage conferences and met all these presidents and met these queens and kings and um, and became one of the most famous person in Utah uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And so I feel a really deep kinship with her one of the reasons she was driven so much to um, advocate for women's political voice was because she recognized the need for women to be self-reliant. As I said, she had to provide for herself economically. She had to raise her own children. Um, and she was not alone in that in um, 19th century Utah. You know, most plural wives um, had support systems, but they might not have been as economically stable um, and as fulfilling um, as they would have liked. In fact, there was there was tremendous dysfunction and loneliness and um, discomfort with the system. And these women did a remarkable job of making the best of it for themselves. And Emmeline is just a, a incredibly sympathetic and complex and um, fascinating character through which to explore this this whole period. And that's why I chose to have her be really the focal voice of the narrative and have the story really revolve around around her and her experience as the leading Utah suffragist. I love that um, she was a transplant, which I think you can personally relate to, right? Yes. And I, and I love that um, for those that aren't familiar with the structure of polygamy or the history of polygamy, that it wasn't ignored. It wasn't pushed aside because it, it became a very... Um, I think empowering part of the story of the suffrage movement here in, in the West and specifically in Utah because of what you just shared and the context in which women were finding themselves in. But I also feel like it was such a great balance that it wasn't the only story because, you know, I don't think it's any secret that polygamy is one of those topics that when you interweave it with any story or any conversation, it can easily become the story. And, mm -hmm. and I wondered, you know, as a reader and also as an author, how you walked that line, because I think you did a really beautiful job of striking the balance of not avoiding and really showing how it was relevant and actually a fire or a fuel behind, but not making it a story about polygamy. Which yeah, thank you. I'm glad that came across. Yeah, uh, there's no way to talk about the Utah suffrage movement without talking about polygamy. They were inextricably combined. Um, in 1870, when Utah women first gained the right to vote uh, here in the territory of Utah, they were given that right because of a a, a bet or um, almost kind of um, just a proposal by a the dare? New York. Was it a dare? Well. I, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a dare, but it was definitely a proposal by the New York Times in 1869 that if the women of Utah were enfranchised, if the Mormon women of Utah were enfranchised, they would vote out their polygamous um, oppressors. Um, at this time, uh, post-Civil War era, you know, uh, polygamy was considered one of the twin relics of barbarism in the 19th century, along with, with slavery, slavery and polygamy. And it was a huge stain on the entire nation to have people practicing this, this strange social order, even if they were in the barren backwoods of, you know, this territory out West. Um, and so they, the, the proposal from the East Coast media and governments that women be enfranchised in Utah was really a strategy to get the women to rise up and and you know sort of rise up against their oppressors. Um, and actually, there's a wonderful slide of this. So um, slide number five shows kind of what the what the political feeling was uh, in the country at the time. Political cartoons are so fa fantastic because they just really represent what the the psyche of the nation was feeling at the time. Um, but the, the Utah Territorial Legislature, who were almost all 
members of the church, all men who are members of the church, kind of called the bluff, right? And said, sure, we'll enfranchise our women, see what happens, right? Um, and what happened, as we can see on um, slide uh, six, is that the women did not do what the East Coast media thought that they were going to do. They actually rose up in favor of plural marriage um, and in defense of their husbands and in defense of their, uh, their rights to practice their religion as they wanted. And this was really the, the crux of the story for me um, as somebody looking at it from modern eyes with my modern perspective and my modern values. Um, I had to really wrestle with why these women who I love so much and really, you know, have so much admiration for and who accomplished so much would really um, sacrifice so much on behalf of a practice and a principle that seems so foreign and really honestly repugnant to me. Uh, and I feel like this is one reason that this story is untold and why we do get, you know, these women's stories and their voices have been lost over the course of history because we are confused and a little ashamed by the presence of polygamy in this story. But, you know, from, from a sort of feminist standpoint to silence women because of who they're married to is totally unacceptable, right? We really have to actually just wrestle with this and say, we might not understand, we might not agree, we might not want it for ourselves, but there was something about it that they felt strongly about that motivated them to do something good that we are still benefiting from today, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I think we see this a lot in history, um, as especially as we're wrestling with it from a contemporary point of view. We have what's called a sort of presentism point of view, which is we take our our morals and our values from today and we overlay them on top of what happened, you know, years ago. And historians, you know, the great team that I've worked with over the past couple of years have taught me that visiting history is like visiting a foreign culture, right? I was Even, yeah, I was just you probably heard that, that phrase. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, these women might even be our own ancestors. They might be living where we're living. They might be belong to the same religion, but it's still like going to Thailand. Like we yes. still have to have that kind of um, distance. And so, you know, having that perspective really helped me as I was writing um, about the plural marriage elements of this, this story. I also think it's really important to understand, and I tried to represent this in the book, that there really were two sides to the, the story of polygamy. Um, on the one side, we do have women, and this part of the story has been underrepresented, who use the system for their advantage to get education and professional opportunities and political opportunities that were not widely available to almost any other American women at that time. Yeah, they had specifically in medical fields and fields that exactly. literally, there was a huge glass, not just ceiling, but wall, right? Yes. Around locked, locked doors, right? Yep. Yes, and the Utah LDS women were some of the first in those areas in, in any sort of critical mass. Um, and they did that because they had this revolutionary domestic system to take care of the kids in the home, right? The, the, the childcare essentially, um, and uh, the, the, that you know, so many women today, unfortunately, still lack. So, so but that's not to sugarcoat things. Um, you have women like Martha Hughes Cannon, who becomes the first female state senator, Emmeline Wells, who becomes so, I mean, and, and they're, this group of women is legion. I'm just naming a couple of them. But on the other hand, you know, we do have the other side of that coin from their private journals, from letters um, that this system was, as to be expected, personally devastating. Um, it was very dysfunctional. One of the things that I learned about writing the book that I didn't know before was that when the LDS church officially disbanded polygamy, um, the federal government required polygamous husbands to choose one wife and one family to continue to be their legitimate family. And all the others, were bastardized and declared illegitimate. And that was 60,000 women and children here in Utah who had to go into exile or were overnight declared illegitimate. And um, it was a huge social cost and emotional cost for that community um, that just is absolutely heartbreaking to me. What a beautiful um, respect and reverence, I think, for a very complex part of our history here locally, but as a church and as a region and as a country, right? It's part of our history that we don't, like many of the more complex and complicated emotionally charged parts of our history, I think it we do a disservice when we paint it with one brush. And I think we do that as women 
to one another, to ourselves and as a culture sometimes. And so I appreciated that you fleshed out uh, complexities. And I, I, as much as we try to look back on history with respect and reverence, I think we can also idealize and and take a bias in our lens of this is what that whole thing was about. Or if she was a polygamist, then it meant all of this because we know these polygamy stories. And that's not true of us today. So I think I think in large part because history books were written by from a male perspective, I think we lose the nuance that as women we love and we savor. You know, I, I mean, I've been married 30 years and we we joke that, you know, at some point my husband will say, oh, so-and-so had a baby, but he won't even ask what gender the baby was, right? right. And, and so as women, we want to sometimes, and, and I don't mean to overgeneralize, but we want to understand the nuances. We want to understand that the layers and the complexities of personalities, of situations, of social structures, of organizations. And so I think there's great value. And I hope anyone who's watching this that feels called to, as a female, dive into history or, or science or any of those things that we bring maybe a natural perspective as female that if we're not careful, we look back at women of history and we actually remove that, that we make them all about one thing. And yet none of us are that we're not, none right. of us are all one thing. And so polygamy is such an overwhelming uh, spotlight that it's easy to just only see that when you look at someone. And so I really appreciated that I didn't get a sense that this was all of who she was. She, but, but she wasn't willing to set it aside. And I think it's important to note that, you know, as we, as we look back on complex issues and social structures, whether it's slavery, slavery, polygamy, or any of the other things that we wrestle with, that we respect the fact that these were women of faith and that that was part of their identity, but it wasn't the only part of their their identity, right? And as women, modern women of faith, it's part of our identity, but we're all grappling with, you know, I've traveled in the Middle East and that was the thing I learned the most is that just like in my own faith, there were various representations of women in that culture representing their faith. And so, you know, I, I appreciated that you gave that narrative and gave an insight into the complexity of what that was. I think this is a good point. I don't know if you feel like this is a good jumping off point to talk about that East-West divide around the suffrage movement. Would Do you feel like that's a natural uh, transition? Totally. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the thesis of the book from an academic point of view, if we strip out the story of Emma Line and the Utah women specifically, the thesis of the book really is a little bit more high level around the West's leadership of the suffrage movement. And um, I really uh, I, I, I really started with sort of a, both a, a statement by a historian, a women's historian, Sandra Myers, who said that the history of suffrage in the West has been almost entirely ignored um, by Western and feminist historians. And then I kind of balanced that with my own intuition of being a native East Coaster. I was born and raised in New York City and moved here from New York uh, 13 years ago. Uh, that you know that there is this perception when that that all good things happened east of the Mississippi, right? And maybe we had the gold rush out there and some but mountain it, or something. Right? But that's it. Yeah. Um, so so I think um, I started with that premise. Why why has that? And especially in this centennial year, as the exhibits were coming up in all you know dozens of museums throughout Washington D.C. and around the rest of the country. Why were these first four states to join the nation, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho, why have they been almost entirely ignored as we're telling the story of national suffrage? So some of your, some of the uh, viewers might have seen the PBS documentary, The Vote. I mean, hours long documentary and literally 90 seconds were spent right. on those first four states. So I just kept asking myself, why? And, and um, my thesis is that it's not only Utah, it's all four of those states that have a very strange, very uncomfortable kind of catalyst for enfranchising their women. Um, in Wyoming, it's um, it was deeply rooted in racism. Uh, territorial governments were assigned by Washington to come and run the territories of the West. So Wyoming's territorial legislature was 
largely composed of um, Confederate uh, soldiers as well as some Union soldiers, but uh, there were Civil War veterans who had been wrestling with the 15th Amendment giving black men the right to vote. Um, and they didn't understand why their white wives couldn't vote if black men could vote, right? And it was also like a stated joke, like the, the newspapers reported that the legislature laughed their way through the vote because they thought it was so absurd. There were 900 women in Wyoming and 10,000 men. So it was a kind of PR ploy that they were trying to get some more women out there for all those men. And that's not like, we're not like, oh boy, right? That's not the feel good, doing it for the right reason kind of thing that we love to rally around. And there were similar things in Colorado and Idaho where, um, Colorado was largely motivated by the silver standard. You know, we don't even really know what the gold standard is anymore. Um, but a, a political lobbying effort around the silver standard and in Idaho, a political lobbying effort around temperance uh, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is another part of our U.S. history that is a little bit strange to all of us, um, you know, banning alcohol. So so you have this 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 group of states in the 19th century that are not um, they're not conforming with our 20th and 21st century ideals of women are people too. This is the right thing to do. You know, let's be, let's, let's uh, sort of move forward into history with a progressive stance kind of thing. That that's not what's happening. And so, so it I was more a fortification of redistricting basically so that there were votes for your bias of what, what your agenda was and that could you rally if you included women to push it over the edge? Is that what I'm hearing you say? In, in a, to some degree, yes, you're okay. absolutely right. Yes, okay. there were other forces at play besides a straight moral line. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, so the other part of the thesis is that in the 20th century, when you get into around the time of the amendment, 1920, we have modern media, right? We have photographs, we have film, we have, um, we have a whole culture of demonstration and protesting and parades uh, and advertising that doesn't exist in with those in that earlier time. And so most of the images we have around the suffrage movement, the women in white wearing the sashes, Inez Mulholland on the white horse, women chaining themselves to the White House gates, all of those come from a very limited time period just before the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and so that's what we think the suffrage movement was when really it was actually a 75 year campaign that included generations of women, millions of women across the whole country. And I think, you know, my effort with this book and this whole year has really been to broaden our perspective of, of what that movement meant. So what do you feel as you have worked through these, these different, I hate to call them characters, but these, these force of nature women that uh, over a, such a long span of time kept the the light on so to speak on this cause when i think you know in a I, I believe in the power of history and studying history and knowing history because as cliche as it is it helps us have an understanding i don't know how many times through 2020 and covid i've I've pondered on and thought of women that have gone through similar experiences, World War II women for sure. And all the stories I've read around kind of, you know, socially distancing and, you know, all the factors of what, what did the children feel as they were seeing their parents grapple with politics? And what do you feel you can share from your dive deep into knowing these women that kept the 75 year fight a life, you know, yeah. because so often, I don't know if this is just unique to our current day, but if we don't get it out of the microwave and we don't get it on Instagram and we don't get a quick fix, I mean, we're, we're done for. It's like, we're on to the next, you know, yep. be flying by our heads that we're now onto. So what did you learn about how these women stayed engaged? Yeah. And, and didn't have, you know, I can text you right now and say, hey, Nylon, Nylon, I'm having a hard day. And can you help me feel good about my life? Because this is what's going on. And these women didn't even have communication to fortify one another. They really had to rely on the exponent or other means by communication of hopefully I run into someone when I go to town. What yeah. did you find and learn that maybe we can learn from today to help us stay engaged in the things that matter to us? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, uh, on the very highest level, I would say that the women engaged in the suffrage movement from its beginning, its official beginning in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, uh, really understood that the movement was about much more than just casting a ballot. This was the movement through which women moved, American women moved from the domestic sphere into the public sphere. So I think it's really important for us to recognize that prior to this movement, you know, women's influence was almost exclusively limited to the domestic sphere. Um, and it's really hard for us to comprehend that today, I think, uh, because, you know, anytime a woman gets an education, um, has her own bank account, ha gets custody of her children, gets a well-paying job. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on and on those things were not available. And those things became available because of the suffrage movement. It wasn't just about voting. Voting was a blunt hammer by which the women saw that they could accomplish these larger goals. They saw that it was their ticket to educating themselves about serious matters. It was their ticket to speaking to mixed group audiences. It was their ticket to managing nationwide newspapers that we were read by thousands of women and that allowed them to develop skills in editing and communication. And it was the ticket to allow them to have uh, financial rights, right? Um, as a professional rights, as I mentioned. So it was, it was a, it was a, the, the transition period and they, they, they understood that. Um, and so I think that's what kept them motivated. You know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't always just, I want to have a voice because you know, I'm being taxed but not represented or because I have, um, you know, a different opinion from my husband or because I'm a person too. It was, it was, you know, I, I am a person too. And so I should have all of these things and I need to have a training ground on which to enter the public sphere. Um, and in fact, at Better Days 2020, uh, we actually uh, unveiled recently a memorial downtown in Salt Lake City uh, on the grounds of the council hall building where the first female vote was cast by Seraph Young. And maybe actually we have a picture of that we could show. Slide number four um, shows a picture of the first woman to vote in the United States, Seraph Young. And the building behind her still stands today and is downtown in Salt Lake City uh, across the street from the, the Utah State Capitol building. And uh, just in August, we unveiled a memorial called A Path Forward for uh, that's on this on the grass outside this building and the I, I love this memorial so much um, and I don't think I actually have a picture of it in my slides here today but I encourage everybody and who's in Salt Lake to go see it it's because so what it does is it, it actually represents the domestic scene through a table and chairs um, and that's just one of the many symbols of the of the table and chairs is that it represents women's domestic sphere and then it also has a doorway um, that has crown molding on the bottom that echoes the Utah State Capitol building. And so the idea is that as you move through the sculpture, you're moving from the domestic sphere and you're moving into through a doorway that represents the public sphere or the, you know, literally public government buildings. Um, and I think that that uh, they they kind of saw that that progression. You know, as I mentioned earlier, that first doorway was not the one and done. The 19th Amendment in 1920 was not the end of their journey. And so even as exhausting as those 75 years had been for um, white women, there was still a lot of work to be done past 1920 for women of color. And we've tried to represent that in the memorial as well um, with additional doorways representing additional legislation that was needed to strip away um, poll taxes and literacy taxes and citizenship issues and all of these things. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that like 1848 to 1920 is a long time. And yes, they were exhausted and it took millions of women, but there have still been an additional hundred years of work that has been done by communities of color to, you know, make sure that all of the other barriers besides just gender are also being shipped away. And that work continues today. Well, I appreciate that the idea that if we don't tell these stories, I think sometimes we don't know what shoulders we're standing on. And what feels very ordinary for my daughter at 14 to go open a bank account. I, I mean, I, it just, yeah. you were talking, I literally, I don't think we paused that day. We took a picture in front of the bank 
and she opened her account. But I don't think I stopped to say there was a day <laughs> that this wasn't even an option. You couldn't even consider these, these ideas that your money at the age of 14 would be your own. And Absolutely. I think, oh, it's such a powerful. And, and for married women to do that, that didn't happen until almost till my lifetime. Well, I, I, the 70s. I, think, of, I think of RBG who has passed yeah. and and um, I dressed up as her for Halloween this year. And yeah, so did my daughter. My husband wear an RBG t-shirt. And I actually plan my costume. This is just not even relevant to the project really, or what we're talking about today. In the summer before she passed, I felt oh, wow. her on my heart. And my husband and I had a conversation that we always didn't necessarily agree with policy. But I said, if you can stop and just honor the things that are just the fact my name is on a title, right. Yep. Of owning a home. And there's certain things that I think it's messy. History is messy. And what yep. we're living through is messy. And, and I love that in a beautiful book, we can take all of that struggle and put some context around it. Right. And give some, somewhat of a, a timeline to kind of make it relevant in our brain so we can use it to then take, and apply to the mess we're facing today. We we yeah. still have doors to walk through. And I appreciate the idea, whether it's racism, whether it's sexism, whatever the isms are, right? That we're that we're sensitive to the fact that there was probably a pioneer before us that didn't have exactly our situation, but can teach us and can inspire us. And and your work and your effort with Better Days 2020, the memorial, and from what I understand, even um, some of the other things that were done during Better Days 2020, that there's an ongoing aspect to to them. You know, I think about the mural that was painted, and and there's been discussion about where it was when it was unveiled versus where it's going to be. And and so, do do you have any other final thoughts that you would like to share about the fact that the 19th Amendment was limited? but that these women within the context of the social structures, the religious structures that they were living in, um, they kept trying to open those doors and, and keep them open and how yeah. we can learn from that today. I think I'll just close by maybe um, if I could ask slide 14 to be pulled up. Um, it's, it's the political cartoon that's on the cover of the book. And as you can see here, it appeared in a, in a magazine in 1915 and I, I think that this this cartoon is just a, such a fantastic representation of all of these themes we've been talking about because the truth is that as the nation neared the 19th Amendment, this was the attitude about the leadership of the West. Um, it was seen the the all of the Western states were enfranchised before the 19th Amendment, and it was actually the last uh, the, and it was actually the first 30 states to join the union that were the last states to enfranchise their women. So you can see that whole Eastern coast were the last states to enfranchise their women. And I bring this up because I just think it really represents an attitude that has been lost uh, with this particular story, but also in many other um, stories as well, right? And other, many other aspects of history. And I, I, I hope if anything comes from the book that we're able to sort of um, revitalize this this confidence and this sense of leadership that we can have as Western states and specifically as as Utahns to look forward with a bright light of um, you know Lady Liberty uh, of hope and lead uh, additional awakenings that you know the, the 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 work that we did in the 19th century can be echoed by our leadership today and that we can honor that legacy um, even even more today than we are currently doing. So I just love this image and I, and I hope that it's, um, you know, the, 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 the feeling that people take away from the book. I love the title of that image as well, The Awakening, right? That we're, we're choosing, we don't awake once, we, we wake up every day, right? Mm -hmm. We choose an awakening yeah. every day. Do you mind if I share um, an excerpt from page 157 in the book? I just yeah. came to my heart as you were talking and and it's a scene where um, at this moment, the room finally erupted with cheers. Bradford took a moment to look back at Emmeline and remembering their conversation of the night before and the vote of confidence she had gained from the veterans' words of encouragement. Emmeline offered back. 
a slight smile. I don't know why that made me emotional, but I just, I feel her like her slight smile of, of this project of your work of women of today. And that for some reason that captured to me that the power of our conversations are really, you know, people don't even need to know the context of that excerpt to understand that a conversation empowered and moved forward. And that sense of, of especially in the backdrop of 2020, that we can still socially safely distance and have conversations to empower one another. And I, and I hope you feel her smiling down on, on the work and the voice. that Well, you've I'll show you, I'll, I'll give, I'll give our viewers a little peek of what I look at every day at my desk. This is what's facing oh. me. <laughs> so she, I don't know. She, is that a slight smile? I don't know if she's smiling. I, I don't know. I don't, I think that's she I, definitely looks at me every day. Yeah, we definitely didn't have the selfie mode of back in the day. So I wonder if they, if the women and men of that of that era felt permission to do selfies, what <laughs> we probably would have had a more fleshed out experience of what their personalities were like. But thank you, yeah. thank you for your time, for your leadership, for your um, efforts to bring about um, and capture and publish uh, words that that need to be kept. I think that's what's on my mind and heart is that so much in life feels fleeting. And I, I still value a good uh, book that's printed in paper. <laughs> I'm still- There is an audiobook version too. Yes, I, know. I don't want to take away from digital formatting, but I think there's such a beauty of that this can be passed and it yeah. can be held and it it's texture. And there's so much in the world that's so fleeting and is lost in the tweet or the text. So there's power in the book. So where can people find you? I know that you have a great TEDx talk and I know there's other ways in which they can connect with you and where can they find Pioneering the Vote? Yeah, so um, nylanmcbain.com is my personal site. Um, I hope that people also visit uh, utahwomenshistory.org. That is our education site where lots of wonderful lesson plans and activities and you know, songs you can download and some of the illustrations that I showed in that in the slides are all there, utahwomenshistory.org. Um, and uh, uh, so, and oh, where to buy the book? Yes, um, <laughs> uh, Deseret Book, obviously. And, um, you know, if you're here in, in Utah, you can order it from the King's English, our local bookseller or from Amazon. Amazon, they, I guess, is keeping all of us, you know, yeah. supplied <laughs> supplied with uh recyclable materials that's what i guess exactly so do. many boxes <laughs> so many boxes i'm always breaking things down and stuffing them in my recycle bed so yeah well thank you it's been a joy to talk with you to to feel the spirit of this project to feel the um spirit of these women and it's empowered me it's empowered me to not give up too quickly and too easily when i face my own self-doubt opposition and maybe even social structures that don't support what's on my heart so thank you for bringing them to life for me and for our readers and and um for your efforts and i think that uh we may have have had a frozen camera so i'm gonna just say thank you for those that have joined us live and for those that will be sharing this video in the future uh, I hope that you'll feel the spirit of this conversation today here at Shadow Mountain Publishing uh, and all the great projects that they are working on. And we'll see you again with our next virtual book launch.